Good evening, church. Uh, this is Wednesday night. It is March 24th. And I'm going to, did I say good morning? I meant to say good evening. I think I said good evening. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I did. Anyway, over the next uh, few weeks, uh, we're going to be studying uh, over a topic that's, uh, at least for me, it's become, and it is very interesting. Uh, uh, I've been at it now for a while and, and really enjoy uh, the study, the reading that's involved in trying to understand a little bit of this topic. And so over the next few weeks, we will be looking at uh, or studying the background of the New Testament world. All right. Now, this is a way for us to sort of um, uh, dip our toes into the, the, the cultural or the culture, excuse me, that Christianity was born in. And for me, that's a really interesting topic. See, the, Greco, the Greco-Roman world or the Greco-Roman culture, and probably for, I mean, just for this study, I'm probably just going to refer to it as the, as the Greco-Roman. I may say world a couple of times, but I'm going to try to keep it uh, short and sweet. But anyway, the Greco-Roman world is understood by uh, most modern scholars and writers refers to a geographical region in this world, a geographical region of countries that uh, were culturally, uh, uh, directly and intimately influenced by the language, the culture, the government, and also the religion of the ancient Greeks and also the Romans. So when you look at the European map down towards the Mediterranean Sea, uh, you look at Italy and, and, um, and Greece and over into Turkey, uh, you'll see the area that we're mostly referring to, mostly the uh, uh, Italian and or Italy and, and, and Greece area. Uh, this is the area, area that falls under this Greco-Roman world. This era um, of cultural history uh, was between the 8th century BC and also the 6th century AD. So it's a wide range of years that we'll be looking at. And so... Hopefully, like I said, it'll give you some understanding of what Christianity dealt with in the first century. Now, I do want to say I'm not an expert, but I am a student who really enjoys looking at this era. Because when I look at this era, it gives me, at least for me, gives me a better understanding of what early Christians experienced, what they faced, and how the culture influenced or the culture or how they influence culture back and forth, but how culture influenced many of the thoughts and ideas that Christianity uh, um, thought of during that time. And then you also understand maybe some of the ideas as to why Paul and some of the other writers had to go in and correct some, some of those thoughts and ideas. So the whole premise of this study is for us to to better understand the historical the uh, social context in which the new testament was written and it is for this reason to help us better understand the writings of the new testament themselves so i hope i made sense as to where we're going tonight what we'll, we will spend a little time looking at some, at least tonight, some family structures and ideas during this Grecan Roman period. All right. All right. So uh, I, I didn't like the way the sound, uh, the what the the, mic- the sound that other microphone was producing. So um, I changed uh, microphones, and so I have this handy dandy uh, podcasting microphone, and see if it does a better job of hiding my flaws, if you will. Anyway, uh, we're back, uh, not live, but I'm back live recording, but we're going to continue our, uh, where I left off just a a split second ago, and we're going to continue our study into this family structure and some of the family ideas, um, different from our ideas, but um, just look at some uh, family dynamics that took place uh, during the first century, or at least the Roman, also the Roman Greco world. So... I'll start off with uh, with women as daughters, okay? Not women in general, but women as daughters. 
So, in our modern Western world, 21st century Americans, and actually in, almost in general throughout the world, the idea of a baby daughter uh, um, really conjures up some very precious pictures and ideas of daughters. I still, I still remember uh, my two daughters. Uh, just the joy and the, 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 I mean, just the feeling that uh, my daughters uh, gave me as they were born. It was different than my son. Uh, surely it was. I loved them all equally. Uh, but, uh, and so, but the idea with your daughters is a little different. And at least for us it is, for me. And then my wife, you know, dreaming up and thinking about the pink dresses and and the bows in the hair and and all the little things that you get to do with little girls and playing dolls and it's just this idea of girls and daughters in the 21st century really brings up some beautiful ideas and pictures of what it means to have a daughter but the ancient world the greco-roman world like we're talking about um Really, the idea of daughters created a high level of anxiety uh, and fear uh, in, during that time. Now, the reason for that is because they had this high anxiety and fear uh, that the daughter might bring the family public shame. So when they thought about sons, the hope of a son was different than the hope of a daughter. The son could contribute to the house and could carry on the family line and so on and so forth. But the, the, the hope for a daughter was that she could bring in a son-in-law to the family. A son-in-law that could contribute to the, to the status and, 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 the good and, the good and bring good to the family. And so just that idea there is totally different than the 21st century. But on top of that, this idea of having a daughter in the ancient world also brought up, again, a lot of the anxiety because there was a lot of effort on the part of families and fathers in general, and, and fam the family in specifically, an effort to keep her pure and chaste until marriage. And it revolved around everything from trying to keep her uh, chaste until marriage through the way she wore her clothes and how she appeared in public and when she could go out in public. And so just that, I, just that idea of girls in that era is totally different than how we think about girls in the 21st century. And so for girls, marriage was very, very important. Because marriage was, uh, was a way for the family to increase their social prestige among their community. It was important in advancing the family honor. And so, to some extent, you could say that she was a tool in the pursuit of greater prestige for the family. Now, there isn't a lot of writing whether the daughter... Uh, uh, participated and willfully participated in the pursuit of greater prestige for the family, but it didn't really matter whether she approved of it, approved of it or not, because she didn't, uh, for the most part, didn't have any choice. So she participated, whether it be willfully or unwillfully. It it was her calling of the day, if you will. So in the Greco Roman world. Women carried the burden of potentially bringing shame to the family by her unchaste behavior. As a group of daughters, as a group when you think about daughters, uh, they were thought of as a danger to the family's reputation. So as I mentioned earlier, they had to take all kinds of steps to try to prevent her from bringing shame and diminishing the reputation of the family in its, in, in, in its community. But when you look at writings uh, about daughters individually, if the daughters individually acted within the social norms, that they could be properly praised as they contribute to the so social respect of the family. And so in, the, in 
the big picture daughter, they were looked at as a danger to the family's reputation, but when you really got down to the personal level of the daughters, they, they, um, they were praised because they could contribute to the social respect of that family. And so it, it's sort of like with us. I mean, we can, we can um, criticize an entire group, but when we come to know that person individually on a, on a, on a more intimate level, it's hard for us to criticize that family and, 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 or that individual. And that's the way it was back then. So, so again, daughters ne didn't necessarily bring up this, uh, this, all these warm fuzzies that uh, we get in the 21st century. They, they probably, I mean, they created a lot of this anxiety uh, because of how they viewed uh, women and all that in, the, in that era. So daughters and fathers in non-Jewish sources, there was more, there's more evidence about the father and daughter relationship and a son and mother relationship, son and mother relationship than there is about the daughter and mother relationship. And it's thought of is because, one of the reasons is because daughters were married off at such a young age, 12 to 15 years old. And oftentimes when the family had the means, uh, children were raised, at least schooled by, <clears throat> by a, a slave or, or someone of a, that was trusted within the family, whether a slave or a tutor, or they, they were raised by this, this individual. And so by the time the mom had any opportunity to really bond with the daughter, the daughter was, uh, was a little older, and soon thereafter, she was going to be married off at a young, at a young age as well. So there was that window where the mom and daughter could bond really um, wasn't very large. And so it is thought of that mothers had a distant relationship, and so that's why there isn't a lot of writings about the mother and daughter relationship. Now, we can't fathom that in the 21st century, that a mom would, would view their daughter in that way, but... Again, we're li they're living in a total, total different era. So the father during that time had, uh, you can almost say absolute power. And the, po the power of the father is nowhere as apparent as his role in accepting and rejecting a child at birth. You know, when you watch the news and uh, the anchor uh, gives you a disclaimer that you may want to uh, uh, not watch this or you may want to take children out of the room or uh, because the, the scenes are about to be graphic. Um, I'm not sure it's to that extent, but uh, it's almost if I had if I had a graphic to put up uh, uh, a disclaimer, I would almost put it up here because some of their uh, behaviors were, I mean, in our view, and in, in history, I guess you, history would judge them rightly in saying they were sort of, they were barbaric. But the father had uh, almost absolute power in uh, a family dynamic. And it was, I mean, it was very evident in this idea of accepting and rejecting a child. So when a child was born in I guess you can call it a quasi-official ceremony that took place. And the child, child uh, would be placed before the father. And if there was that uh, Simba moment, you remember in Lion King? What was the name of the monkey? I can't remember. Would raise that child up, <coughs> would raise Simba up and, and to, the, to, to the king uh, animal kingdom. Well, it's so, almost like that scene. Uh, not quite, but almost, you know, almost. So in a birth, excuse me, in a birth, if a, uh, the child was placed before the father, and if the father raised that child off the ground, it was signifying to the family and to the community that that father took responsibility for that child. But if the father did not pick up the child, the newborn infant was cast out of the family. I know you're, you're probably asking yourself the same question I asked myself when I was studying this, and how do you cast out an infant from a family? Well, it was rather barbaric. So if a newborn was rejected by the father, it was either killed indirectly or 
this other method, which was, it was simply called exposed, the child was exposed. So if the child was exposed, and I'll explain that in a moment, if the child was explo exposed, excuse me, was exposed, it might be rescued and raised by someone else. But usually if a, an exposed child was raised by someone that found the child, then it was usually raised as a, as a slave. So, but if it was exposed, for, so exposure was a, basically was a term of leaving the child out so, that, so it would die from the elements. I don't know if you can call it worse yet, but or worse yet, that it could die from uh, being eaten by an animal. Rather barbaric. Rather barbaric. The father did not actually place a child, and, it, and it's almost like you, you want to say you're a coward. The father did not actually place a child outside the house. That was done by another a household member, or it was done uh, by a slave, and yes, to s sometimes even by uh, the mother. Now, uh, we don't know, or history doesn't tell us how often it happens, but there were instances where an exposed child uh, would survive. And in essence, an exposed child was a child that was taken from the home by a slave uh, family member or a mother and taken outside of the, of the city and left there, and as I said earlier, either to die from the elements or worse yet, it would die from being eaten by an animal. But there were times, though, when a child would be saved and by someone and that child would be saved, and usually that child was taken into the family and re rescued and taken into the family, and, but it was actually raised as a slave, not as a child, but it was raised as a slave. And I guess in, in, in their era, it was better to be saved as, and live as a slave than die, I guess. I don't know. I'm not an ancient. But although it was taken in and saved and taken in as a slave, the child was technically free and it was free to be able to leave at an appropriate age. Now, there were some instances where the situation became, I guess, uh, rather complex. For instance, if a child was rescued after being exposed and the father who did the exposing found out, he could, he could choose to reclaim the child. He had that authority to do that, but oftentimes the person that did the rescuing would require some monetary, or, or not necessarily monetary, but some compensation. So a father could eventually, if he chooses to, or chose to, he could reclaim, he could reclaim a child that he exposed, but it would be done by paying the family some form of compensation. Now, Sometimes, like I said earlier, sometimes the infant was abandoned in an area that had uh, lots, well, I actually didn't mention it, I mentioned a road, but there were uh, not designated, but known roads where they had high traffic areas and, it was an, it, and they were known for people placing unwanted infants, uh, sort of like our fire stations or our police departments, when you unexpectedly or expectedly have a child and you decide you're not re ready to raise it and now you can go leave it, leave it at the police station or the fire station and, and the child will eventually be left out for adoption. Well, there were roads, or there weren't fire stations and police stations, but there were roads where an unwanted infant could be placed and somebody could come by and uh, rescue that child, all right? So, where, why would a child be exposed? A child would be exposed if it was uh, a disabled child. Sometimes a child was exposed if it was a girl and the father didn't think it could contribute to the family dynamics and 
and and bring honor and and, and all those things that go on that, and so they would expose a daughter and so these roads um, provided these high traffic at roads provided some hope for a child but sometimes uh, be careful what you wish for, right? So sometimes some of these, when these children were exposed and left out on these roads that were known to have exposed chi- children laid there, slave dealers were known to take an exposed ch- child and oftentimes they would sell that child into slavery because the cost of buying a slave was high during that time. Or, worse yet, or the second of of two evils, or the child would be placed, eventually would be placed into prostitution because it was also a highly profitable business. Sad, right? Justin Martyr was an, an early Christian apologist and also a philosopher, and if you've done any reading and in church histories and all that, or if you've been my, or you're my age or older, you probably have heard of Justin Martyr. But he states that there were more girls than boys who were exposed. And when you think about how they looked at daughters and sons during that era, it makes sense why more girls were exposed than boys. So a fourth century BC Greek comic, comic poet writes that everyone raised or raises raises a son a son even if he is poor but exposes a daughter even if she is rich a note written by excuse me i forgot to put my phone on silence so a, a, a note written in 1 bc from a husband to his pregnant uh wife sort of reveals this idea of exposing a boy and, I mean, uh, uh, raising a boy and exposing a girl uh, sort of reveals the sentiment hadn't changed much from the fourth century to the first century BC. 300 years, and it seems like this, this idea continued to be fostered in their community. So in this note, a husband working in Alexandria reassures his wife that he is doing well and he, he and that he soon will send home his pay to her so but in that note in that note this is what he writes he notes that if and she was pregnant he notes that if you have a baby before i return and it is a boy let it live And if it is a girl, expose it. Those were some very harsh realities of that era. And it continued not only in the the 1 BC, but it continued into the time of Christianity. And so Christians lived under a very complex and to us, we would call a very barbaric time. And so, but the Jews didn't practice this idea of infanticide, exposing children or killing them. It was not common among the Jews. And so what we'll do next week is we will maybe recap a little bit of what we covered today and then look at some uh, uh Jewish writings or look at some, and, and some thoughts and I'll share with you what those thoughts are and how the Jews dealt and related with this idea uh, or how they their views of, of infanticide or exposure all right well I enjoyed this I don't know how long I I, I this 20 minutes or so and I look forward to sharing with you some more of, of what I've learned over the years and just give you a flavor of what it was like in the first century. I hope you have a blessed evening and I'll see you next week. Have a good night.